Hey, what's up, everybody? Happy game day. Eric Kane, Ben McKee here on Game Quest for the Music City Bowl edition against Purdue. And just like every regular season Game Quest, it is brought to you by Smoky Mountain Organics. It features some of the, be uh, the best brands and CBD products, bath and body care items, organic teas. They have the largest selection of plant therapy essential oils in Tennessee, plus many more items. And uh, being new to Vol Quest, they want to start off by welcoming all the new volunteer fans at any location. If that means you go in to any of the in store locations and mention Vol Quest, you're going to get 15% off your total purchase price. That's on in store purchases only. Gatlinburg Pigeon Ford Severable and the newest location in Knoxville, 8018 Kingston Pike, across the street from the Traders Joe's. A big thank you to Smoky Mountain Organics. Uh, at the top, I want to apologize. My voice sounds like crap, but it is what it is. Ben McKee, it's game day. It's been about 31 days, I believe, since Tennessee uh, last played a football game and trying to pick up win number eight on the season in Josh Heupel's first year. Yeah, happy game day. Uh, you know my motto, don't take these for granted. If, if you love SEC football, college football, like myself, you typically only get 13 a year if you make a bowl game, Yeah. Uh, which typically Tennessee does for, for the most part. But uh, you only get 12 guaranteed games a year, and hopefully you're lucky enough to, to get a 13th, uh, if not a 14th, and a 15th. So you know my motto, don't take these for granted. So, you know, I, I feel like, of course, this is not the college football playoff. This is not a New Year's Six Bowl game, even those have kind of lost some luster here. But being here this week, had a good time, but I just feel like there's no juice heading to this bowl game. And that doesn't mean that Tennessee's not preparing, because I think they are. I think Tennessee's taking it very seriously. Um, I like what I've heard from the players in terms of their media availabilities and, and Josh Heupel and coordinators. But I just feel like even the Music City people that are putting on this bowl, I just feel like no one's excited about it. The, Purdue's lost a little luster as well. We'll get into the injury situation, but two All-Americans aren't playing. A bunch of wide receivers aren't playing. Kind of, kind of. Where, where are you at in terms of the meter of you know getting juiced up for this game? Because I feel like it's it's not as high as maybe it should be. Yeah, I mean, I I haven't picked up on that vibe personally. Okay. Okay. Maybe that's a me thing, but uh, to me, just kind of when I you know evaluate the vibe of a of a football game, I kind of look at the and, and at least a bowl game, I yeah. should say, uh, a bowl game. Are, are the players locked in and ready to go? Tennessee is is are the fans locked in and ready to go? And I, I think Tennessee fans are very excited for tomorrow's game, or today's game, I should say. We're recording Wednesday night, but you all are listening to this on game day. But but the players, the coaches, they're ready to go, and the fans are ready to go. So from, from that standpoint, I, I do think that there, there's a, a good little energy uh, around the bowl game. And um, some of those Butch Jones teams, there wasn't a great vibe of going to the Music City Bowl because – you lost to Vanderbilt when, if you beat Vanderbilt, you go to the Sugar Bowl. Yeah. So you, you underperformed that season. You did not meet expectations, whereas this year, Josh Heupel and these seniors, Hinton Hooker, far exceeded expectations. So there's still that, that excitement of year one of Josh Heupel. So I think there's a good vibe going into today's game. Okay. Well, the, the big stories are, um, obviously, K. Mays will not play at right tackle for Tennessee. Alante Taylor will not play at cornerback. But for Purdue, you have two All-Americans, David Bell, wide receiver, and George Carliftis at defensive end. Furthermore, at wide receiver for Purdue, no David Bell, but his, his Robin to the Batman, Milton Wright, seven touchdowns on the season. He's not playing due to academics. You have Marshawn Rice, wide receiver, is not playing. Um, Abdur Rahim is not playing. Brock Thompson, who's banged up already, he is – going to play, but he might not be as effective as, as he, what he normally would be. So the wide receivers are taking a big hit. Your left tackle, Greg Long, is doubtful. Anywhere you look at it, I mean, you you got a starting cornerback in, in Dedrick Mackey, who is, is not going to play for Purdue. So Purdue is limping into this football game, and I just feel like Tennessee's got a lot of areas to where they can take advantage of it. Yeah, and it's a good thing Purdue is limping into this football game because when the – the, the matchup was announced and within a couple of days of recognizing that, okay, Alante Taylor, he's opted out. He's not going to play in the bowl game because he, he's battling an injury. He's going to pursue the NFL, and it, it makes sense. He, he was dealing with injuries that nobody knew about, and no need to, to continue to, to push that when it's time for him to get ready for the NFL. That, that was an understandable decision. Millions of dollars on the line. Yes. Yeah. Um, but you got nervous because – Quite frankly, I don't, 
outside of Theo Jackson and Alante Taylor, there's not much to be confident about in the secondary. I agree. Right now, and that that matchup was concerning because you saw David Bell on the other side. You know Purdue's going to throw it around a ton with Jeff Brom and Purdue quarterback Aiden O'Connell, who is a very good quarterback. So that was concerning because you're going to be without Alante, and it was already a suspect secondary in, in some regard. And you look on offense for Tennessee, and Cade Mays, the ankle didn't seem like it was going to be good to go by the bowl game. And you, you saw their stud defensive end, who's, who might be a first-round pick, a likely first-round pick. Yeah. And you, you start to get worried about the matchup. But since then, you just detailed it. I mean, Purdue has had a lot of guys opt out for the bowl games, the two studs that we talked about. But they've also had some guys deal with academic issues. You mentioned uh, the, the number two receiver, who is David Bell's sidekick. But they're, they're thin at the slot corner as well because their fifth-year senior did not make the trip due to academics as well uh, they're, they're starting left tackle Greg Long he's questionable to play so it, it looked like the matchups maybe favored Purdue at the beginning just because of some key guys for Tennessee being out but now that role has really flipped uh, on Purdue and Purdue's going to be missing several several key guys and not because guys are necessarily opting out for strictly the the NFL but and not even COVID you, I mean in a bowl season in which COVID is taking place left and right and, yeah. and ruining bowl season left and right. Purdue's not dealing with COVID. They just had some NFL draft op- opt-outs. They've had some injuries, uh, some academic casualties uh, as well. So I think it's a good thing that the that role has kind of reversed because now you look at it on paper and, I mean, Tennessee should, I think, easily win this football game. Yeah, yeah I'm not allowed to. And I think pretty much all of us kind of had Tennessee rolling in this one. Um, you look at what Purdue likes to do. You know, they, they try to establish the run. They just don't run. They're not physical up front. Um, they throw it for over 340 yards of contest. They average just 84 yards on the ground. Um, they're not very good in the red zone. They only scored a touchdowns in the red zone less than 50% of the time. But they're going to try to do ball control. Um, for the most part, they hold on to the football a little bit. But do you think that with the injuries at wide receiver, it's going to change the game plan for Aiden O'Connell and Jeff Brom at all uh, coming into the game day? <laughs> no, uh, no. Uh, I, I think they're still going to try to throw it uh, as much as they have been. And, and quite frankly, they may even just go all out and just – Yeah. you hear in, in basketball live and die by the three. I, I think <laughs> that is going to be the case today for Purdue, but it's, it's going to be <laughs> survive or die by the, the passing attack. I mean, they're, they're going to – I think they're going to throw everything – they have at Tennessee trick plays, every passing play. And, and in the they book. should, you know. Well, yes. Why not? There's no, there's no game next week. Correct. There's nothing to lose yeah. if if you're Purdue. And if you've heard Jeff Brom talk this week, he's discussed that like, hey, we're still going to do what we're going to do, what we've been doing. We'll have some inexperienced faces in there. We'll have some new faces in there. But we're excited to see them compete. And and that tells me that Jeff Brom is going to change absolutely nothing Mm -hmm. and like on paper you you think that Tennessee secondary still has the advantage um because David Bell and and the the other ones are out but I'm telling you Aiden O'Connell's good and and if Tennessee secondary is not ready to play inexperienced or experienced receivers I mean he's still capable of of torching that secondary quite frankly and and keep in mind too the offense just from the get-go always has the advantage why because it knows the play you know and when you're playing Mm -hmm. against a suspect secondary which is what Tennessee has been this year, to be completely frank. Um, yeah, I wouldn't just dismiss what uh, Purdue's going to run out there later today just because they're missing some guys. Uh, Jeff Braun was asked in his media availability on Wednesday, did you <laughs> excuse me? Did you envision throwing the football as much as you do this year? He's like, well, I'm a quarterback, so I like to throw it around a little bit. And so <laughs> if from that perspective, I, I think you're right. I think we're going to see that a lot today. So a quarterback for Tennessee, that's been a big discussion point. Alante Taylor's not going to play Warren Burrell will play, but is it going to be Kamal Haddon? Is it going to be Brandon Turnage? I think we're going to see a combination of both. I think we'll see Kamal Haddon first because he's played that more this year, that position more, already has a start under his belt as well. Yeah, and it sounds like Kamal Haddon is going to get the start opposite of, of Warren Burrell. And, and this is a big game for both of those guys. I agree. One game's not going to lock down the job for next year, obviously, but Warren Burrell has a skill set. Like, he has the tools to be a, a really good corner. I mean, he, he kind of reminds me of Emmanuel Mosley. Yeah. Um, and he, he's had an up-and-down year, more downs than, than ups. But 
th this is big for him to to show Willie Martinez and Tim Banks and Tennessee's coaching staff that hey, like I can be the guy next year at corner. And I think it's also big for him just from a confidence standpoint as well, just to build some confidence going into next year and just have something to build off of. And I think that applies to Kamal Haddon as well. And it seems like he's going to get that start at corner. I still kind of view Brandon Turnage as a nickel guy. Maybe that changes this offseason. Um, but I, I – This word, he was always a corner since he had an immediate yes. need. He stepped up and filled that need, played really well. Right. But he just doesn't look like a, an inside and, guy to me. He's, yeah, he's kind of small. Yeah, and, and maybe I'm just simply pigeonholing him into to nickel because that's where we've seen him this yeah. year mm -hmm. when he filled in for Theo earlier this season. But, I mean, it's big for Brandon Turnage as well. We should throw him into the Warren Burrell, Kamal Haddon thing because they need to show Tennessee's coaches that they can be reliable next year, and they, they need to build confidence going forward. You know, we talk about linebacker and how it's so shallow – Tennessee has no depth, and, and it doesn't, but you know, that's how cornerback was and the, how big those two wins were uh, via the, the transfer portal this past summer uh, heading into camp. Do you see Deshaun Rucker maybe getting a look at Kenneth George will not play in this football game, but Deshaun Rucker, Christian Charles at safety. He's a guy that we anticipated seeing a lot of this year. Injuries kind of sideline him. He's healthy. Could you see some true freshmen getting some run later today? Yeah, but I, I think it'll I think be, more Charles than obviously Rucker. Yeah, and, and for both of them, I mean, I, I think both could play today, but I think it's going to be based off of how the veterans we just talked about perform. Yeah. I, I think if if Warren Burrell, Kamal Haddon, if, if they struggle in the first quarter, if they struggle in the first half, then I could absolutely see – Willie throwing Deshaun Rucker in there potentially now Willie Martinez has the reputation that he's not going to throw youngsters <laughs> into the fire so maybe this is a pointless conversation and maybe he'll just ride it out with those veterans but if if they're struggling why not yeah throw Deshaun Rucker and in at there? this point in the season I mean you're you're the last last day of the season right I mean this is this is the bowl game there, there's no tomorrow yes these true freshmen have been practicing all year long so you know we always hear well you know they're, they're not a true freshman anymore if they've at this point in the season it's kind of the truth um, playing the last game for Tennessee, Matthew Butler, Jaquan Blakely, uh, Caleb Tremblay, three guys up front that obviously Matthew Butler had a huge role. Jaquan Blakely was a starter on this football team. Uh, Tremblay was a nice addition to add some snaps and everything. And when you look at Matthew Butler and what he's done uh, throughout his Tennessee career, um, a guy with not a lot of high hopes, but ends as not, a, not one of the best players in the SEC, but a guy that will be in an NFL camp come next year and with a chance to, to maybe earn some money. Yeah, I, and that's kind of the – I think all of those seniors for Tennessee this year are kind of in that in that boat of, you know, flirting with being drafted, particularly Theo and, and Butler. But they'll definitely get a camp invite. Yep. And it would not surprise me one bit if Matthew Butler or Theo Jackson are on a roster come September. <laughs> I, I think they are more than capable of making an NFL roster. Theo's mm -hmm. going to – and I'm sure he could do this. I guess we just haven't really – seen him play a ton of special teams because he hasn't had to. I, I think he's been on some coverage teams. In, in years past, he's yeah. played all of them. Yeah. But like Callaway, Mark West Callaway, he's been able, until he became a, a focal point of the, the passing offense for the Saints, I mean, he, he was able to earn a roster spot because of what he also added on special teams. So I think Theo's going to have to make sure he hits that out of the park. But um, th those guys will definitely get a camp invite at minimum. And it, it wouldn't surprise me to see them sneak into the draft either. I just I wouldn't have placed a ton of money on it. But they've had awesome, awesome seasons. Obviously, Matthew Butler had the sound bite of the week. Oh, man, that was uh, great, on, wasn't it? Yes, he, you know, he was sitting on that. He was waiting on it. You know, he's saying it, it just, he just thinks it's hilarious how they're practicing at Vanderbilt. Can't do anything about yep. it. <laughs> Enjoy stomping on the V a little bit. Now we go ahead, but I, I thought I thought that was uh, incredible sound yep. by earlier this week. Yeah, and then this game means a lot for Theo because he I mean, he told us earlier this month that he his home his parents are 15 minutes down the road from from Vanderbilt yep. and from I mean Vanderbilt Nissan Stadium not that far apart so 15 minutes from downtown so you know that game's going to mean a lot to him and look Jaquan Blakely I, I think he's been one of the more underrated players I agree for I mean, Tennessee this year we talked about that on the podcast earlier this week a little bit yes. like he's not a guy that's flashes he never has been he's always in the right place but he has been steady this year and he, he's a, a good kid quiet leader so it, it'll be cool to see them kind of have their their last dance so to speak 
Now, the story of this game is going to be Tennessee's offense against Purdue's defense. Purdue's defense, of course, no George Carliftis, which is huge. 11 and a half TFLs, five sacks, likely a first-round draft pick. Uh, starting cornerback Dietrich Mackey, three interceptions on the season. Those guys aren't playing. But this is a defense that's given up just 20 points a game, um, about 340 yards of total offense the other way. 74% of the time they're holding team, or 51% of the time is what uh, teams are scoring uh, red zone touchdowns against. They've got 16 takeaways, a very aggressive, stout Big Ten defense. And it is going to try to adjust and combat the tempo that is Josh Heupel and Tennessee. And this is the same case for every game this season, Ben. First quarter is going to tell the tale. Yep. If Tennessee goes out there, scores a couple of times, and puts Purdue in a hole, it's over, in my opinion. Yeah, I, I, I agree. Uh, because I, I thought Alex Golish and Tim Banks had great answers to being asked about the first quarter success this season on Wednesday at the official Music City Bowl press conference. Alex Golish was asked directly, what is the one thing that you point to as to why you all have had so much first quarter success? And his answer was as simple as, you can't replicate the tempo in practice. Yep. And you can't. You can talk about it. And if you're an opponent and make sure your team is aware of it, your defense is aware of it, you just can't replicate it in practice unless you have a similar offense. And, and I, Ole Miss handled the tempo as well as anybody. Yeah. And that's because they go up against that tempo in practice. It's not Tennessee's tempo, but it's very similar. They go up against it all the time in practice. Uh, so Purdue's not going to be used to this tempo. They play Big Ten football. They're not going to be used to this tempo. Uh, and, and then Tim Banks also, I mean, and, and here's why. For Purdue, from the per Purdue perspective, they've got to survive the first quarter. Yep. Um, because Tim Banks' answer I thought was terrific. Um, speaking to, you know, there, there's a stigma about how the, the defensive coordinator with Josh Heupel is a, a bad position to be in if you're a defensive coordinator. Oh, it's coach. horrible. But it's one horrible. one of the positives that Tim Banks pointed out is that okay yeah you know maybe they put us in some unfortunate circumstances, but because of the tempo and Tennessee or and Josh Heupel's offense jumping out on folks, the opposing offense all of a sudden is down fourteen nothing, seventeen nothing, twenty one nothing. Missouri, what was it, twenty eight nothing at the end of the first quarter, mm -hmm. and that puts a ton of pressure on the offense. So th there's pros and cons to it, obviously, and. Purdue has to find a way to survive that. I, I don't know that they will. We'll see. The the inexperienced factor of, of players having to step in for Purdue obviously plays into to Tennessee's hand. You got a weak south linebacker, Jalen Alexander, that kind of leads this team in tackles, about 95. And uh, you, no one is really even close outside of that. Cam Allen is a safety. He leads the team with four interceptions. I think those two guys are the ones that are going to kind of flash uh, for this defense with Carl Liptis out and Mackey out. Uh, Cedric Tillman. 69 yards away, nice from picking up. Nice. Nice from picking up uh, a 1,000 yard season. So that's going to be a point of emphasis. Just like with, um, oh gosh. Who are you blanking on, Kaner? The, the dog, 49ers. Oh, my oh Jawan Jennings? Yeah, because they, they needed to get him touches yep, there yep, in, yep. in that game in Tampa a couple years ago, or Jacksonville a couple years ago. So. I'll look for that, but I'd be surprised if Cedric Tillman doesn't get to the a thousand. I'd be shocked. Yard mark, I, it, especially the way he ended the season. Yes, yeah. if if he does not reach it, it's because he got hurt. Yeah, early in the game. Yeah, but will be the final game for Bayless Jones. Mm -hmm. Will be the final game for Javante Payton. Mm -hmm. Then everybody else, excluding Cade Mays, which we believe is probably not going to be back, but I mean, everybody else is back on this offense. And something that we wrote about earlier this week on the side. Something we've been talking about, Hendon Hooker even said it. This game could be a springboard into 2022. Does it mean anything in the grand scheme of things? No, but to tie a bow on the 180 that this program has, you know, endured under Josh Heupel, and to kind of put you in position to where you head into spring practice with a lot of momentum, that can start today with your quarterback and Hendon Hooker. Yeah, and, and you know, I'm one of the storylines that I don't. I think has really been talked about enough is uh, what Tennessee does at right tackle today. And yeah. that, that's going to dictate just as much next season as anything. I feel like maybe it hasn't been talked about enough because Dane Davis has played so much. Yeah, maybe because so. Because Cade's been out, maybe. Maybe so. And maybe the, 
folks were just holding out hope that Cade was going to play. But but Jeremiah Crawford is coming to your point. He'll play today. Yes, and like we talked about earlier with Warren Burrell and Kamal Haddon mm-hmm. and Brandon Turnage needing to show the coaches that, hey, they can – be relied upon and also build some confidence going into next year. I mean, that that same conversation applies to Dane Davis and Jeremiah Crawford. Um, You you add the Florida transfer, but it's going to be a battle in spring and throughout the summer and fall camp amongst those three to to win the starting right tackle job with Cade likely moving on. And Jeremiah Crawford, Dane Davis, they have the upper hand Mm -hmm. on Mincy right now, the, the Florida transfer. So, the, it, it's important for them to, to show that, that they can be relied upon just as much as it, is, as it is for those young corners. And somebody you've been high on, AP's been high on this year as well, and he will be the undisputed leader of that offensive line moving forward, Darnell Wright. Yes. He's a guy that I think's had a pretty solid year. Mm-hmm. I think he's lost weight. I think he's comfortable. And I, I think it was Alex Golish that was talking on him uh, yesterday. Just seems like he's having a good time. I feel like with Cade now gone, but most likely not playing today and you know, likely going to the NFL, Darnell Wright can now step up and be that guy on the offensive line moving forward. Yes, I, I, I think Darnell Wright had as about as good of a season as anybody on the roster. Yeah. Quite frankly, just nobody talked about it. And, and if you're a left tackle, you don't want to be talked about. And that's good, yeah. Yes, that is mm-hmm. good. And it was cool to hear Alex Golish talk about how when he walks into the building now, he's just smiling yeah. and asking you how your, your day is going. And it's it's just with everything that the program went through over the last 12, 14 months, whatever it's been, yeah. I mean, those kids have really been through a lot. And Darnell Wright didn't sign up to, to deal with what he had to deal with last January and, and February. And I can imagine that really wore on some of the players mentally. And something Goler said today, I mean, these kids are playing for coaches they didn't sign up for. Exactly. I think that's something we, we often just, just completely lose in the shuffle. Yes. These guys were not recruited to play. They, like You have a choice when you sign with the university. That's why you always need to sign to the university, not the coach. But you have a choice. You are signing to a coach. None of these kids signed to Josh Heupel, but obviously, I mean, that's college football. It happens all the time. But um, it just kind of get it just the buy-in. It's, it's been there all season long. Yeah, and just with Darnell, I mean, I think he's going to be one of the better tackles in the SEC next year. I mean, I just think he had a really, really solid season. He, I mean, he's not flashy like a, like a first-round offensive tackle would be but I, I just thought he was really really solid and, and all you need to know is that he was not talked about yep. <laughs> because that that usually dictates how and a left tackle is going or we, any tackle any offensive lineman we talked about him in years past so yes we have and I think <coughs> I really think Tennessee's offensive line has the potential to be a you know a, a real strong point yeah. of the team next year just with four of the five coming back you got to mm-hmm. figure out the right tackle spot yeah. don't know that any of the three options are the answer. We'll, we'll see if any of them can, can step up and grab the bull by the horns and, and be reliable. But f- the other four, Darnell, Carvin, Cooper, Spragans, another year. And not only that, Ben. Think that should of how be many, real solid. I, I couldn't agree more. Think of how much Kingston Harris played before he got hurt. Think of how much Ollie Lane played. If Kingston doesn't get hurt, I mean, he's un- – unless poor performance takes place, I mean, he's still your starter maybe. Maybe, yeah. Potentially. Maybe, maybe Spragans is that sixth guy. Mm-hmm. Obviously, he still would have played a ton because of the injuries Cooper dealt with and Carvin yeah. sliding over to center. And that I just think that offensive line overall, when you can run block, you're going to give yourself a chance. This, I mean, Tennessee average over 200 yards on the ground. The scheme helps with that. I, I get yes. that. But protecting Hendon Hooker will be a priority because they allow too many sacks. But overall... I agree. I, I think this can be a bright spot moving forward. Well, and mainly because they'll have cohesion. They'll, they'll have played with one mm-hmm. another. I, I think they can re- really be a strong point next year. And then, then you add Hinton Hooker's legs behind them yep. and uh, Jabari Smalls. I, I think Jalen Wright is going to take a big step. Come on, Jeremy Pruitt. <laughs> I think Jalen Wright's going to take a big step no, next you, year. You said, you said Smalls. Jabari oh, did I say? Small. Sorry, I've been hanging around Austin, and Austin's been hey, doing let, his Jeremy Pruitt impersonation every five minutes. It's spot on, man. It's <laughs> spot on. Hey, let me ask you this. We talked about some of these younger guys already today. Uh, Darnell Wright. We mentioned Warren Burrell. Who were some of these younger guys that might not play a huge role today but might get a little bit of run? And, and something that was asked to me on my Twitter Tuesday show at Locked on Balls, go ahead and listen to that when you're not listening to the BallQuest uh, podcast or the Mailbag podcast. Um should there be a balance? If you're a Tennessee coach, should you give run to Jimmy Callaway, Jalen Hyatt? Or, mm. I mean, if the opportunity presents itself, sure, play him. But 
stick with your guys because they're the ones that got you here. How should that work? And if so, who are some of those young guys that you expect to see in there? Maybe some today. I, I'm not playing them unless you need to. somebody gets hurt. I agree. It's a, a blowout one way or the other. I, I'm not. Play, play your three. It, and A, those three deserve it. Yeah. B, I think getting to an eighth win is just so, 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 so important um, for, for perception. Okay. And ending this season with, with all the, the built-up momentum and built-up goodwill that, that it seems Josh Heupel has built up to, to go out and finish with a loss to Purdue that, that is having some – is missing quite a few key players. I mean, I, I think losing to Purdue – I mean, it wouldn't be devastating or anything like that, I but it would be a real sour note to, to finish out the season. So I think you just – you need to – your main focus has to be on – winning an eighth yeah. game and then if those vet, those corners and dbs that we discussed earlier if they're struggling if, if trayvon flowers Jalen mccullough are having a tough day then throw christian mm-hmm. charles in there if he's healthy uh throw it to nico slaughter in there if, if somebody gets banged up that that'd be the only way that i would do it and especially with jimmy calloway and Jalen Hyatt. i mean that, quite frankly they haven't built up trust to be thrown into a game when you when you're really trying to find that eighth win yeah the way the question was presented was like should the coaches take that into consideration to get some like goodwill mm-hmm. and it's a good question i i understand where uh where the uh, the poster was coming from but if i'm josh hop i'm like i don't care if you're not going to be here, no. you're not going to be here like right. i'm not going to create right any i'm not going to script any plays for you in this game because again javante payton maybe we'll never play football again let's, let's get him out there you know what i'm saying so like right. i thought that was a good question also going back to something you said if you lose this game is it the end of the world no it's not but i do think with purdue at full strength if you lose this game it's like okay that's a good football team you lose this game now it's like oh man purdue was at like 70 yeah. percent it, it to me is kind of like the the kentucky game a little bit different, but I talked during Kentucky week like this Tennessee football team losing to that Kentucky football team isn't a sin. Like that's a good Kentucky football team, yeah. but it is a sin because Tennessee just does not lose to Kentucky. Yep. And th- there's kind of that same perception of, well, Purdue has all these guys missing. It's Purdue, SEC football versus Purdue. Uh, like Josh Heupel would, in my in my opinion, would unfairly catch criticism. I agree. Just because of the – and in this instance, maybe it is fair criticism because they have the, the, the guys missing and this Purdue team isn't as good as Kentucky. But it's, it's just the, the, the goodwill that's been built up, it could quickly slip away by, by losing to Purdue in these circumstances. So there's no need to throw guys in there to, to see what you have for next year. Yeah. Like, it would be nice, but an, but an eighth win in year one after what they all – what the program went through last offseason mm-hmm. would be just absolutely huge. Like Jalen Hyatt will get snaps because he gets snaps every game, but you're not gonna you're not gonna make him go from eleven snaps to thirty. No, and that's what the spring is for. That, yeah. that's, that's, I agree. That, I, and I know you can't replicate game reps, but you, you learn all that in, in the spring, in in the summer, in, in fall camp, and I like with Jimmy Callaway and Jalen Hyatt. Like I, I I don't believe that they flipped the switch that quickly mm-hmm. they, they have to get better monday through friday sunday through friday away from game day in a while we had such high expectations for jalen high and rightfully so because they're they're as talented as anybody yeah I still they, think, they have the natural talent to to play at the next level quite frankly I but they, they got to get better sunday through friday my goodness if hyatt does not de- uh, develop some upper body strength he'll never make it right that 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 is the key. He yeah. he has to get in the weight room. He can only play in the slot right now. Yes, and, and I've said it a couple of times on the board. I, I do think Jalen over the last month or so has had a realization of of what he needs to do to mm-hmm. get this turned around and, and be the player that he's capable of being. Yep, he's very talented. Um, all right, two more things. Uh, how do you see this game playing out? We did our prediction piece yesterday. I think all of us pretty much picked Tennessee to roll. I just I don't see much different. I, I, I see Tennessee than, than what's happened already in, in 12 regular season games. I see Tennessee coming out there, jumping on them quickly because Tennessee's tempo is nothing you can duplicate. I see a little bit of a lull coming in, you know, second quarter on once they start to figure it out. But I think that first quarter is going to be big enough for Tennessee, and I think Tennessee is going to make an effort to uh, pour, <coughs> excuse me, pour it on and continue it in, in the home state in Nashville. So 
I see Tennessee winning by two touchdowns plus. Yeah, I'm with you. I predicted a blowout, and I don't like predicting blowouts. I don't either because it makes you look <laughs> like a fool. And this defense is good. Yeah, and, and I, I, I really don't like predicting blowouts in a bowl game either just because mm-hmm. it's a bowl game. And w- what you think is going to happen, typically the opposite, yeah. <laughs> is what ends up happening. But, th- I mean, this Tennessee team has, is as locked in uh, as it can be, I think. Yep. And I, I really think that they're, they're here to – Prove a point, I, I guess you could say. I, I, I really would be surprised if, if they didn't play with good effort, good energy this afternoon. And, and just with all the guys that Purdue is, is missing, I would be very surprised that Tennessee wasn't able to take advantage of, of those matchups. So I, I expect Tennessee to roll. Bowl prediction time. You've had a lot of fun with this this year. You've, been, <laughs> you've almost hit a couple. My bowl prediction, Tillman, Peyton, Jones, all find the end zone, all three of them. Yeah, I, I love the bold predictions. I've been real close. I, I hit one, the the Valus Jones, was it the kick return? No, you were five yards away from hitting oh, that that's one. that's right. That was Tennessee Tech, I remember. Freaking Valus, you're going to get five more yards. You, you hit a couple this year, though. Yeah, I'm, I'm failing to remember them off the top of my head. But my bold prediction will be, I'll go uh, Kamal Hatton, pick somebody off, picks Aiden O'Connell off. He'll, he'll, he'll get an interception. That, that's my bold prediction, Kamal Hatton. Filling in, trying to, trying to prove something. I, I say he'll he'll pick off Purdue. That'd be good news for Tennessee. It'd be that good news be. for him to springboard into the new semester as Tennessee's slotted quarterback at that spot. For Ben McKee, I'm Eric Kane. This has been Game Quest. Um, it's brought to you by Smoky Mountain Organics. Go ahead and give them a look. And if you go in there and mentioned Vol Quest, you're going to get fifteen percent off your total purchase price. That's on in-store purchases only. And you can go to any of their in-store locations in Gallenberg, Pigeon Forge, Severable, and the newest location in Knoxville, 8018 Kingston Pike, across the street from the Traders Joe's. Plenty of coverage at VolQuest as we venture on through game day. We'll have the game day thread. We'll have Rob's four takeaways following the game. We'll have coverage video, press conference, players. We'll have our post-game pod. We'll have a couple columns out there. All that and more for the Music City Bowl against Purdue. Guys, thanks, thanks again and enjoy game day.